Kelly. And hello, so everybody. Welcome to day four of our Out of Control Dog Summit. And this is our final Q&A of the week. It's been a really great week. Um, I've had a lot of fun hearing people's feedback and, you know, it's been great. Well, li listening to the interviews again and watching the presentations. So, um, yeah, this is our, our big day. Um, there will be some information next week about the reactive dog toolkit with Ian Dunbar. There's, look for something in your inbox next week about that. And as every day, we are going to promote our sponsors. Ian, do you want to promote the sponsors today? Can you oh, do it? Oh, good Lord. Sorry, my, my head's in the uh, reactive dog toolkit now. Um, yes, we have I got we it. have a trainer on the <laughs> uh, line, Doggy Dan. Doggy Dan, yeah. and we have Holy Pets Holy and pets. the Healing Vet. I know, I, I got first. it right today. No, I said yes. it first before you so, put your foot in your mouth. <laughs> but seriously, thank you to our, our sponsors. Uh, extremely grateful. Um, everybody should be grateful because this information has been free all week. And available to anyone um, because of our sponsors. So that makes me very happy. And, and available to us too. I, I've had great fun with the presentations. I made notes and I have ticks all over no. them when I think it's a good point. And I think Melissa, Excellent. she got the highest of four ticks for one thing. Yeah, be unpredictable with your trap. Uh, you know, this whole consistency uh, yeah. thing. I mean, MJ. who MJ, can be she's consistent? Awesome. You know, Let's face it, right? Yeah. And when you're unpredictable, as Joe Rosie would tell us, that sets the happy hormones raging. That's why people, mm -hmm. you know, become addicted to gambling. You know, think when you yeah, buy yeah. your lottery ticket, how you feel immediately after you bought it. You you start spending it right away and saying, "Well, I would put a million dollars in the accounts of all these people by magic," and you're feeling good. And then, of course, you don't win, but it felt good for a while. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We have a lot of questions today, so I think we should start right away with our first question. Oh, my, my Frenchie is snorting in the background. Oh, oh, I no. <laughs> okay. I have a 14-month-old rescue old English bulldog. He attacks my feet, jacket, and lead every day when we get ready to go out. He's extremely rough with me. How do I reverse this, please? Oh, you've got well, an adolescent bulldog. That is a lot right there. I love it. I have the same solution, but a different problem. When I used to walk Phoenix, she would walk by my side calmly, and then she would pounce in the air and, like, come down on cat poop like it was a mouse and eat it. Then the evening, you're sitting on the couch, say, hi, Phoenix. Oh, a little bit of black. Oh, it was horrible, you know. So I got this log and I said, right, Phoenix, today to continue walking, you have to carry this log. And we didn't even get out of the driveway first time. We go back inside and we do it again. About the fourth try, she got it. Keep the log in your mouth and the walk continues. So now no cat poop. Well, same thing. The jaws are occupied. You don't need a log, of course. I just thought it was butch for Phoenix. It could be butch for a bulldog too, you know carrying a big, like a fake dumbbell that says one ton on it, you know, like they have in the cartoons on the telly. And then um, if the jaws are occupied, then it can't bite the leash, can't bite your trouser legs, can't bite your feet or, or what have you. So I'd go that route. Yep. I mean, and with that, with that same thing in mind, I mean, bulldogs, this was a big issue with a lot of the dogs in the shelters when I was doing the open paw programs on the regular. Uh, you know, basically, they, they're, I mean, this is an adolescent bulldog. They want to bite. They want to fight. They want to pull. They have energy, even if they're an English bulldog. And so tugging, tug of war with rules, bringing a tug, a tug with you, giving them something to carry their tug, play with it occasionally, take it away, get some attention, play with the, uh, occasionally. Uh, because grabbing at you like that is, it's, it's, you know, they're trying to play, especially this is a big thing in shelters. You know, they, they always grab the lead, right? There's no toys. So they want to grab the lead and they want to tug. They're trying to engage with you. So keeping the mouth busy, giving the mouth something productive to do. Azelle, no, no. Uh, my little Frenchie bulldog rescue is um, trying to get into the snacks. We're in Airbnb today. She found the 
cabinet where I put the snacks and she's crying. Very sad. Very sad indeed. So, so um, today, because I'm yeah. at the seminar today. Yes. Oh, that's episode. it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. No, I thought I was, was very good at this short answer, but I do have something else to say. What? You know, if you've got a, I say I do have something else to say. If you have a little tug toy, it's great now every 25 yards to take a step back when you're walking your dog, come sit, watch. It's brilliant. In preparation for other unruly dogs out there, at least your dog is sitting and looking at you. So I think yeah, I, I did that in the previous up. summit. Yeah, with a little dog called Jambo, who it wasn't reactive, but he was pretty much over the top. And it's a lovely thing to do. And the great thing about it is, rather than having food, when you're dealing with a, maybe another reactive dog, food is probably not a cool idea. A, a tug toy means nothing to other dogs, but to your dog, it means everything. Yep, I think it's, it's people don't, utilize toys on on walks often enough really and we like those carcass toys sometimes you need to real, really bring a big meaty tug for some big dogs but we love those those carcass toys they're kind of yeah, like I love those. flat run over animals that you can because it's got no stuffy in it you know it's got squeakies but no, no no stuffing so you can easily shove them in your pocket okay next question that was a good one <clears throat> Jessica, my three-year-old pity has to be. Oh. oh, it's gone. Question disappeared. There we go. Three-year-old pity has to be on tie out in my fenced-in backyard because he jumps the fence, which is four feet. How do I get? How do I get him to learn to stay within the yard? Well, well that's a hard one. Nah, it's not. Nah, it's easy, Kelly. Come on. It's a little pity. So instead well, of staking it, you know, in the backyard, I'd tie it to a tree and then hang tuck toys from the tree, you know, like in our backyard. So the dogs can jump up and hang from them, shake, you know, the little tug tree. Now they have a yeah. reason. So you need toys um, in the backyard too, you know, if you're yeah. going to be there on its own. You know, if they're escaping, there may be, and especially, um, I don't know if this is it's a three old pity. I don't know if your dog has been with you all along or maybe came from a shelter where the whole reason they're there is because they were escape artists. I don't know if he is intact because that would also cause some wandering. But my guess is there's, it's, it, yeah, the yard, he's in the yard alone, too long and bored. Um, you know, but once they start jumping a fence, it's really hard to get them to respect a boundary at, at only four feet. So, I mean, you do have to think of safety, whether you're staking out, um, Kennel runs are actually a better option for that. It's safer, and I don't know where you live, but um, you know, I I love the tractor supply all over the U.S. There's tractor supply, and it is um, it's their poultry pen though, not their dog kennel, because it has a roof, and it's it's a it's a cage, an eight by eight cage that I use when I have uh, rescue dogs and such, and uh, that way they can't get out while you're teaching your dog to chew on toys and do interactive toys in the yard. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, um, you know, if they're intact, neutering might help as well. Um, you can also, Ian, you're, you're the gardener. What you would do, put put wire up and then string plants. Yes. You don't have to, because getting string plants is very expensive. Very strong piece of or wire, about two feet higher than the fence. Then you can hang some um what you call it um yep. industrial cloth or um oh come on not chicken wire slightly stronger than Why? chicken wire a two-foot strip you can yeah, hang it from it and it's a very mesh, cheap way uh, to increase the height of your fence well even the wooden, you, can, you can buy that lattice work as well yeah, you know you can yeah. you can make your your fence yeah, taller and with the pocket well. that way but you know, in the meantime, you might want to can. I mean, keeping them in the yard is all about enrichment. A digging pit, a sand pit with you know things you can hide. Ian, do you want to talk about your Stop sand your pit? Your digging pit. I'm gonna go grab Azelle because she's just crying by the treats like a starving dog, and it's annoying me. I'll be right. All back. right, uh, don't worry, Carrie. I'll take care of it. Um, yeah, make sure oh, your fence is secure. If it's not high enough, oh, make it high. Yeah. And there's a lot of cheap ways to do that. And what I always do is then plant trumpet vine. Uh, which will grow 20, 30 feet either side and thread it through the top 
and that's also a nice, a very pretty visual barrier. Okay, next question. I'll see how many questions I can do before she gets back. How do we break the only man walking into training, sniffing potty in Richmond and play? Is it okay for my dog to pull? Oh, really? I thought you were going to win it. Don't work. Um, no, when, once you're outside, and I generally forget treats, and I go with the walk, sit, good dog, let's go. So let's go as the reward, or go sniff. And every 25 yards, I break the walk by just asking the dog to sit and look at me. I was just doing it before we started this. I walked three dogs, and Dune is really getting it. If I stop now, not only does he sit, he looks up at me, and that's the cue for me to say, let's go. And we, we walk on. Um, but generally, they'll be blowing off treats for a while. So you've got to use the distraction as a reward, whether it's forging into the environment. So go pull. That's what I taught Omaha because he would just always walk a little in front of me. With go pull as a reward, he would heal really nicely right next to me. Go sniff is a huge one. Or let's go. Let the walk continue again. So you must integrate training into the walk and into play sessions in parks otherwise you don't stand a chance against other dogs rear end squirrels and pee on the grass yeah this is an engagement and training question really i mean no no if you if you put the the, the ranging and sniffing and pulling on cue then you will also be able to get a better let's go and stay with me um i mean pulling it back forcefully you know it takes two to pull Right, and so and we're going to get opposition. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Uh, opposition reflex. It's not a good idea. Um, you know, change direction. Do what I was talking about yesterday. Maybe you weren't here yesterday, but you know, change direction. Be unpredictable. And then when your dog catches up, yay! You're like, you just don't walk in one direction. And this is this is for training. Obviously, you don't have to do this for their entire life. But um, you know, you you want your dog to look up at you. Most people, oh, this in, infuriates me. It doesn't really infuriate me, but it drives me mad. Um, training when when I'm when I'm with hand, with them when I'm with clients, and I'm watching them walk their dog. They are missing so many opportunities to reinforce. So they're focused on when the dog is pulling, which might be a lot of the time. I I realize it might be a lot of it, but there's times always times when the dog goes and looks up at you, and and they tell it yeah no. No feedback. People don't even usually notice. And even if they did, they don't say anything. You have to go, oh, my goodness, hello, good boy, look at you there. Oh, I'm going to give you a treat that. Boom, 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 look up, spin. Yes, good dog. Walk, walk, walk. Look at you looking at me again. Oh, I'm going to go over here. And no, you don't have to do this for life. But you have to first build the, the desire to want to be next to you and follow you. So um, treats might uh, – treats in and of themselves – aren't going to work. First of all, you could be doing hand feeding and walks and making um, more value of part a portion of a meal that way, but also throw a treat in the air and have them catch it or talk to your dog and back up a little bit and give it to them or, you know, like, you make, it's the, it's the relationship. I mean, the food is a primary reinforcer, but it can be boring and it can really kind of actually devalue the connection if you don't also take time to connect. So, um, Pulling on leash once it's began, especially if you've been an adolescent dog or adult dog that's been doing it for a long time, is a really hard thing to change. It's totally changeable, but if you have a habit, it's just going to take some time and you really will take you noticing when your dog checks in. Um, uh, every little glance, and it doesn't have to be, my dog checked in and is healing. It's, they're walking along and they stop pulling for a second. They glance at you, oh, yay! And then they want to be near you. You know, so it does take putting a little effort in. Um, yeah, a little, little excitement, you know, look in the mirror, lighten up, brighten up. And then when you walk your dog, think you're tangoing with it. The steps are beautiful, you know, boom, 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 like that. And then the dog suddenly, or, or this, I, I, here's a great tip. When you're walking, try whistle or hum that, you know, hi ho, hi ho, and oh, you <laughs> cannot verbalize that without doing this, I hope, I hope. And as soon as you do that, the dog looks at you. Shepherds think, oh my God, yeah, it's gone crazy. This is not meant to be fun. This is meant to be obedience, you know, and they go, but the dog looks at you and engages because you're actually acting like you are having a good time. 
Yeah. All right. That was a fun question. Next one. Hi, Tricky Chai with your cool glasses. Oh, wait. Yep. This question is for Dr. Dunbar, please. Training a second right. service dog will be easier than my first service dog. Certainly, um, you know better now how to train a service dog, but of course the big variable is the dog. <clears throat> that um, it doesn't matter how good you are as a trainer, eventually along comes that dog and he pushes you <laughs> to the limit. But that's where you grow. You know, I, I love dogs like that that really puzzle you and you have to sit and think about it and you have to take a deep breath. You need a lot of patience. I think dogs like that are, are wonderful teaching dogs. Um, so it depends on the dog. I mean, I, I have yeah, uh, I mean, three of them downstairs and uh, one's a piece of cake. One is cool if you're doing what he wants to do. And the other one is has been very difficult. But now on my walk, he was the best dog walking, best healing dog, most responsive dog. But I still have to give instructions and guidance to him. Without guidance every five, ten seconds, warm, he turns into crazy dog again. But we're really getting. You know, I mean, training. I mean, when you, I mean, you. There will, in, no matter what you're training for, if it's not your first time, you, like Ian said, you certainly know what you're doing. Uh, better and you're more informed and you can make a great plan but dogs are also great at you know destroying your plans by being by being a completely different being yeah <laughs> so continue to grow no matter how many dogs you're training and whether it's for sport or for service dogs um but it will be easier it, it gets easy. it's no matter what it's easier it might be different challenges but it's always you know you get you get better at it so i'd say Yes. And that All is right. the great Next test question. of a trainer. I mean, way like 30, 40 years ago, I knew some trainers up in Chicago in the competitive obedience, and they would look for the perfect dog. And one guy I knew, very famous, he went through 11 dogs, and after a few months, said, no, this isn't the dog. And, you know, which is one way to do it. I love it when someone says, you know, I'm going to do agility with a basset. And, you know, it's not the perfect breed for agility, but, oh, man, you're going to have a lot of fun. You're going to learn an awful lot. And everyone will be dying to see you compete because it just makes them feel good. Look, there's a Bassett doing it. Of course, they trained him. And he's fast, too, you know, on cue. At his own speed, he had to lumber along. But if you say hustle, he can really accelerate. So I, I love people that will use... Um, not a chosen breed to do something with, whether it's as a pet dog. I mean, I'm sure we'll all agree some dogs naturally take to domestic living. Others don't. They want more. But we can take any dog and we can teach him to chill. You know, we can take any dog and teach him to speed up. He may never be as fast as a greyhound, but, wow, he can certainly accelerate. And I'm thinking of a basset yep. here that actually competes in canine games. And she wanted it to be fast, so we used a pretty um, strict differential reinforcement. And in the quarterfinals, this dog beat out the Border Collie in the doggy dash. Come and sit. And I, I think the Border Collie just wasn't there. <laughs> I'm drawn against the Basset. Ho, ho, ready, steady, go. <laughs> and, of course, Bassets, they don't push from the back. They pull from the front, and they are strong. So their acceleration is extreme. What they can't do is keep it up over 25, you know, after 25 yards. You don't like my story? I, I was it. doing well when you were I gone. Didn't I, guys? I you're did not very a very good answers. Huh? Yeah, no, your stories are lovely, but you're not a seminar. And so people are, we just, we have so many lovely people that have questions. We want we to resolve problems stories. in two minutes, right? Um, we don't want to talk about a basset when no one's talked about a basset. All right, next question. Someone's got to keep you on track. Okay, hi, I have a question. I have a 19-month-old yellow lab and a seven-year-old English cocker spaniel. 19 months and seven years. Can you give me suggestions for safe and fun together play for them? Okay, so you're, yeah, you're young, exuberant lab and then a smaller seven-year-old English cocker. Um, 
I, I think in general, you know, what Ian was talking about yesterday, I think it was yesterday, again, it's all a blur. Um, you know, making sure that you don't let play ramp up too much. Here, the, the size differential is your biggest issue, perhaps. You know, seven years old isn't very old, but an English cocker could be could be quite quite a bit smaller than a yellow lab. And I think, you know, I mean, hopefully the cocker um, is assertive and stands up for themselves. But if not, then you're definitely going to have to intervene and make sure play doesn't get too rough. But by having these training interludes that Ian talked about yesterday, stopping play every now and then for recalls or downs or one does a spin, one does something else, or one goes to platform, one gets a training second. You know, in, incorporating yourself and obedience into the in the play will help a lot. So at least you can say, stop it. One other thing that I do, I know Ian's going to have lots more to say, um, is, you know, I've got dogs that are quite different size differential, and I don't allow a ton of run. I, never, I don't let them run, basically. I've got, you know, Malinois and Rottweilers um, with, um, you know, uh, border terriers and, and Frenchies and, and so a Boston, a Boston Cairn Terrier. So, you know, tiny, tiny dog, not tiny, but you know, dogs that are less than 20 pounds and then dogs that are enormous. And, um, I don't let the big dogs run with the little dogs or run after the little dogs. Um, my little border terrier, youngest Eve, she, Eve, who is in the essential puppy training course, she wants everyone to chase her. But that is a bad game when you've got a bunch of gamey turfs and Malinois and the Roddy is just a you know, big clod, but he's huge. Um, so I, I have the big dogs lie down most of the time. We do couch play. We do um, Arabella, my most fiery Malinois. I say you have to lie down when you play with the littles. You don't get to run around. You play jaw wrestle. You can, they can play hide and peek under the thing. Uh, your dogs probably aren't as big of a a size differential is that, but I, I, I have rules around how they play and I do absolutely stop. Even the little terriers that are the same size because they're terriers, I do, I don't let it get cray cray. You know, I break it up and have a, and I don't yell at them or anything. I just like, girls, come here. Okay, down, look at me, you know, come here. You cookie time, whatever it may be. Ian? Yeah, I, I think Melissa today said, um, incorporate play into training, you know, gamify it. But also, you want to integrate training into play. You know, play is, of course, it needs rules. Um, any sport you talk about, netball, uh, American football, you know, rugby, you know, we're playing, but there will be very occasional injuries. But I think what people are worried about is, uh, is one dog hurting the other? Is one dog bullying the other? So I always like to, as well as stopping the play, if I even think that this play, the play styles are uneven or the other mm -hmm. dog's owner thinks it's uneven, I do what I call the bully test. We do this in puppy class too. So you just take hold of the collar without saying anything. You take hold of the collar of the label bully and you watch what the other dog does. And it's very illuminating. Usually the other dog that was running away and, you know, barking and, and whatever, it then stops, looks, comes running back and says to you, let go of my playmate. What are you doing? I was having a good time. So that to me is proof positive. And um, do it frequently if you're, you're worried. It's always, it's a wonderful test in, in research too, tethering one dog, holding one dog and seeing what the other dogs do. This is how we did our preference tests. We tethered six males and then let a bitch in the area to investigate for 15 minutes. And uh, we, we followed them for two years through the bitches' cycles. And one bitch, Doris, I remember, she loved Ken. If we went up to the enclosure, always the closest dog to Doris was Ken and vice versa. They were buddies. Um, when she came in, and in this test, she would go in, say hi to the other five male dogs, hello, sniff, sniff, goodbye, and then settle down next to Ken in his circle. And she would score like 14 minutes lying next to Ken. When she came in the heat, though, she'd say, hi, Ken, bye, just going to see Cassius. And she'd spend all the time with Cassius. And then when the heat period was over, she would go up to Ken saying, just been away for a while <laughs> and go back to. So we have social preferences and sexual preferences, and you can look into the dog's mind and see what it prefers or what it likes by doing preference tests. 
Stop. That was a beautiful story. With your eyes, Kelly. <laughs> you can see that. My <laughs> story, even doing. behind those glasses. That's commonly known as Ian. <laughs> Shut up. All right, come on. I'm doing <laughs> short answers today. Aren't I, everyone? Yes, they all said. I can see everyone Next here question. on my screen. They're all saying thumbs oh, up yes, to I'm me. Sure. Uh huh. Um, I have a 2.5 year, two and a half year old rescue that bears teeth on or near the sofa. Mostly my husband is near the sofa, so he's he's location guarding, um, and he'll touch teeth to skin. By touch teeth to skin, you mean he goes nip gently, but I mean, is he biting? <laughs> um, so you know, like if he's mouthing, like kind of protests, like get away. And that is a low-level warning, and it is does sound like low-level sofa guarding. Um, and you say on or near the sofa, or he might be guarding you. It might be you know, might be um, you know, owner owner guarding one from the other. That's a resource guarding of sorts, right? So um, a dog that guards the sofa in my household would not be allowed on the sofa until you resolve this. Um, <clears throat> And or if they are on the sofa, I would unceremoniously push them off when they do that. This little one, when I got her, um, you know, as a foster a few months ago, she would guard me in my lap. She would guard on the sofa and she got pushed onto the floor many a time. Um, not hard, but, you know, sorry, out of here. You cannot act like that. I don't support that. I put her down or, you know, if she was in my in my arms. And in the meantime, we did a ton of classical conditioning. When other people and other animals were near, I would you know, be ready and hold her collar because she would lunge, and you know, and I would reward her for not reacting and reward her for the proximity of other people and dogs. Um, you know, so it is something to take seriously. And if they're just doing this low-level, you know, mouthing, um, then it's but it, it it it's still probably a warning. So it is something to take seriously if the teeth are touching the skin in this guarding type of scenario. So um, when people come near, you do have you have the, the dog secure so they don't lunge. I don't know if this is a large dog or how. It's a rescue dog. I don't know how long you've had this dog. So you don't know if it's only been a couple of weeks, you have to be careful. If it's been two years, then maybe not. You know the dog well. But um, I don't tolerate that behavior. You, don't, you have to have polite, friendly behavior in order to be on the sofa. It's a privilege. Um, you can, in the meantime, you can go to your bed and across the room and sit in, it can be a comfy bed. It can be a lovely bed. This isn't a punishment, but you cannot be there acting a jerk, you know? Um, it means they're, you know, they're uncomfortable with that scenario, but it's very often because they're guarding. Yeah. yeah I, um, number one, the dog is not dangerous because it's, it's done this probably several times. And as yet, you know, your husband still lives. Well, um, but number two, this is totally inappropriate behavior. You must stop it, and your husband has to stop it. So what's the feedback you should give? You should just say, as Kelly says, off the sofa, or I used to say, outside. You've just lost the whole living room. One word, outside. And then I'll get up and go, on, go on, shoot, shoot. Don't want you in here. And then go and sit down on the sofa, and you, of course, can hug your husband. However, I'm kind of on the husband's side here. I want to give him advice and so we can solve this in like three, four days. Okay, no food bowl, no petting from you, no food from you. Your husband hand feeds the dog, backing up. Come sit, treat, come sit, treat, come sit, treat, over and over and over. Then follow me, he'll sit, treat, he'll sit, treat. He'll... I will guarantee within three days, you're going to call us up again because you're really pissed off because your dog only has eyes for your husband. It usually takes about three <laughs> days. The most common presentation of this problem is not with a husband and wife who've probably been married for you know 40 or 50 years or something, but it's a unmarried woman's new boyfriend. And I've done this so many times and I take him aside. I say, wife can't listen, the girlfriend can't listen to the advice and I tell him. Now, you're going to be hand feeding the kibble, but here's what you do. You go and buy some freeze dried liver and you grind it up in a mortar and pestle and you put it in a little pill. And every time you get the kibble, you put it in a plastic bag with a pinch of freeze dried liver and shake it. 
It, now the dog thinks you're feeding him freeze-dried liver because that's what it smells like. <laughs> but that dog will be your best friend after about three days. And especially with a rescue dog because they've gone through so much change and they're looking now, who is the sweetest person I'm with? And it's hard for some husbands to, you know, talk like Kelly, like, oh, he said, there's a good dog. There's a good dog. You're looking at me and stuff like that. So I tell them, you can say good boy in a gruff voice, and then you can feed 10 bits of augmented kibble, we call it. So it's only kibble, but it smells like freeze-dried liver, and the problem will be solved. And you must do this quickly because uh, behavior never stays the same. Kelly said that three days ago. No. If you train it, yet, if you don't train, it gets worse. It doesn't stay the same. It gets worse. And next up, we'll have blood. Yeah, it hardly ever just goes in the direction that you want it to, does it? No. Okay, next question. It'd be awesome if it did. Uh, okay, Kathy said, 10-month-old GST likes to steal Kleenex and bathroom garbage. I upgraded garbage to a closed lid, but has still figured out how to lift the lid. Is there any way to stop this bad habit? Um, I mean, you know, dogs are scavengers. They love to do that kind of thing. And it's reinforcing if they get into stuff. I, you say you've upgraded your garbage um, to a closed lid. I might do even just more management, either um, a different garbage can. Um, those simply human ones or simple human ones are pretty strong. You can't, the, the, the lip of the can is underneath the thing. You can't really... Dogs can't open them very easily. Uh, you can also perhaps put the garbage in a cabinet or close the bathroom door. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's also an adolescent thing. So if you prevent it for a few months, it'll probably go away. But also this might mean that your dog has um, a desire to hunt and forage and do things, which you can do in your garden or in your house with appropriate toys um, in other rooms. So give... The other things, like, I don't know if you, you may not want your dog getting into paper at all, but, you know, you can use old paper bags and put toys or treats in them or chews and put them in other places in the house so the dog can rip up that kind of stuff. Or, you know, like brown wrapping paper or, or brown paper bags or just really just toys. It doesn't have to be paper. It just sounds like that's something that your dog is interested in and you can give a better alternative. But you can also just use toys that are puzzle toys around the house where they have to lick or extract or roll um, and give your dog something to hunt and search out and sniff out other than your garbage while also managing as much as possible. This is a 10 month old German shepherd that is telling you they need more work and they want to solve problems and be a detective and sniff things out literally. That was what I would say. Um, yeah, also I, I 10 would... months old, you're doing might be still getting maybe getting a little too much freedom unsupervised you might want to use a pen or or something um you know a 10 month old um, adolescent dog should not really be out of your sight loose in, in the house or in the you know in, if they're still getting into things when you're not home, i would home create a new habit and as kelly always mm -hmm. says uh, you know good habits are just as hard to habit so no food bowl only fed from hollow chew toys of which there are a wonderful variety i like the kong i used to love the squirrel dude which is no longer i think made which is a great shame um hollow bones once they've got the marrow out um then restuff them with moisten kibble and freeze them but then back to the garbage can. Come on, get, let's get a garbage can the dog can't get into. I mean, I have uh, two of them downstairs, one with dog food in it, one with garbage in it. But then the next thing is there's garbage and garbage. Last night, the dogs are watching me carve a roast chicken, and uh, uh -huh. I'm just very careful to take the, the, the killer bones, you know, in, the, in the, the, the wing, forearm of the wing out because they are chokers. Um, but also it's cooked chicken, which ain't so good. And I was putting it in the garbage and they were watching me. As soon as I'd finished, I washed my hands and took that garbage out to the dumpster. So there's garbage and garbage. You know, is it paper products? Is it recyclables? When it's food scraps, if it's something as smelly as a freshly roasted chicken, um, I wouldn't even trust it in a safe with dogs around. So it goes to the dumpster. But you garbage cans yeah. dog. Garbage dog. Dog. I mean, the, 
yeah, the simple humans, like they're really the the ones that we have, they're really nice because it's not just the steppy this thing you step on and it comes up, but like the way that it closes, there's no lid to push up because it, the the rim is higher than the the lid and they can't nose it and you can barely get it with your fingers. Anyway, yeah. next one. Okay, great info on play today. Four year female. Four-year-old female dominant rot mix and a year-old rotty female that mix is afraid of the puppy. Wait, I'm four-year-old female and a year-old, okay, at the moment separating, not only the rough housing. Um, bitch play can get pretty, pretty intense at play and, and, and often stops being play at a certain point if the rotty is a year old. If the mix is afraid of the, uh, um, the full-on younger adolescent burgeoning adult female Roddy might be for a reason. Um, yeah. You know, separating, yeah, I, you know, you might be having some, some, you know, bitch hierarchy stuff happening here, which can be dangerous, with, especially if you've got two large equal, equal breeds. Uh, it's hard to say without, um, I wouldn't allow rough housing either necessarily. You don't want to have to separate them all the time though. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, I'm sure Ian will have a different opinion, um, with big dogs, at least as this one's growing into herself, the young one, is um, not to let them roughhouse and play, not these two, especially if the female doesn't want to. She may be dominant, but she may not be able to push more than the other one, and that's a hard pill to swallow. And that can be, if, you, if they're kind of equal in, in, in status, in their minds, they can have a problem. I wouldn't do roughhousing. I would do lots of parallel play on your beds, on your mats with toys, uh, classical conditioning when you're in the room together, uh, walks, calm things. And um, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I mean, I can't say for sure I don't know your two dogs, but based on what you're saying, I wouldn't let rough housing happen either. I wouldn't always separate. I would have them out together under managed um, circumstances when, you know, when you can, and then separating, of course, when you're, you know, when you're not around. Um, remember Ian, when Ivan was, you know, who was very, very confident, my Roddy back, back in the day, he was a very confident, very socially savvy dog. Um, and a big boy, tall, but kind of skinny. Um, and he was so good at reading other dogs that he never had a problem. No matter how cocky the dog was that came up to him, no matter how silly, no matter if they irritate him, he handled it perfectly and adapted until one day, remember, he was probably about six years old, maybe um, maybe even seven, and I came home all upset because he rolled for these two Akita-type dogs. Do you remember that, Ian? I came no. and we were at the park and I just ran up to him, and I've never seen this. My big, strapping, confident boy flipped over and was like, cried uncle, and they didn't even do anything. They just kind oh, of ran up. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my baby, what happened? And Ian just said, you know, he's smart. You know, like you're, he may be tough, he may be cool, but you got to know when you're not the biggest dog attitude in the house anymore. And he still was playing it cool and he decided to call uncle. Anyway, my point is, even if your dominant Roddy might not be as dominant as your as your year old female Roddy, <laughs> and, and um, be very careful. Those are big, strong yeah, dogs. I mean, to me, these are very woolly terms. I mean, I think I know what you mean when you say dominant. I'm more interested in, you know, what type of bite inhibition that the older dog has. Have you seen it play with other dogs? Have you seen it mouth other dogs and things like that? Um, I agree with Kelly. I would not let these dogs be together yet, but I certainly wouldn't separate them totally. If you do that, they'll never be together. So let's think two years on, you're now living in a house with two dogs that can't be together. That's not what you want. So when you're playing though, it's two dogs, they're two big dogs. I would have two um, savvy Rottweiler people there monitoring the behavior of both dogs when they play and playing games um like walking five yards apart then four I, yards apart or three then I one you. i have a question for you on this then so here's the thing like in my experience it's a question and also a comment um in my experience adult females are not very playful in general maybe with some puppies maybe with a few friends right so do they need to play or do they just need to coexist? Like, you know, fem I, you know, in your experience, how many female dogs play with other female adult dogs? It's not really a thing, you know? Um, Is it? I think I think they play. They play differently. They are 
crazy and as stupid male adolescents, you know, that do all this crazy physical stuff, a female would be more inclined to, I'm going to lie on my back now. If you want to engage, come up and I'll pour you a bit, and mouth you and stuff like that. So they do play, but the play is, is very, very different. Um, but again, I, I think as much controlled play, it needn't be contact play, but having fun together, playing games together, having competitions to find sense together, doing equal races and, and things like that. So they're together and they know you're happy and it's your demeanor which will uh, decide which direction this goes. If you don't have, who is it, Matt Beisner, that you have got to be confident in your dog. If you're not, the dog will take that, as I said yesterday, take the fear in your heart and magnify it a thousandfold and throw it back at you. So, you know, you, you, you mustn't let your fears unintentionally, you know, amp this dog up. But I, I always, no. when I have dogs, I, I've lived with uh, one pair of dogs that couldn't be together. And it was a 10 year old that we rescued and just didn't like the resident male. And the fights didn't cause damage, but they were still ugly and unpleasant. So we lived for another four years with these dogs um, separately. And I'll just never do that again. It's no fun for the dogs well, either. Um, so they, you know, my view is I want them to get along. I want to, they needn't be best buddies, but they can tolerate each other and feel fairly happy that, you know, they're there, not dislike each other. That's what I don't want. Uh, them to no, do. but the, I think, I think if, you're, if it's going in the wrong direction and you have the wrong personalities and they're both bitches, uh, not two neutered males, I think it's, it's, <clears throat> I think the, the, the play is the thing that ends up tipping a lot of the times. They don't need, like you said, they, they can hang out. You can, I like to do two balls or one has a Frisbee, one has a ball. They know which toy is theirs hanging out together. I think, the more they play, the more likely it's like it's going. It might tip someday, and then once bitches fight, you don't. You know, then there's grudges, then you have problems. And these are big dogs. Hard to say on um, in this scenario, but there are some tips and ideas from both of us. Um, yeah, let's go next one. Anna, my next door neighbor hangs a mop outside her bathroom window. My GST constantly barks at it. <laughs> I have asked her to move it, but she still leaves it there. <laughs> That's kind of funny. You know you're annoyed, your neighbor is trying I to... I think we it. should let the people, from what we've said already, let's let people work this one out for themselves. It's not a difficult problem. But what's happening is, you know, when people present problems, they come up with one little, you know, conditioning clause that makes it impossible. It's my neighbor with a mop and she won't listen to me. No, I wouldn't either. I would say get lost. You know, I like hanging my mop out the window. What you want me to do? Go downstairs and hang it from the line. So the answer is you teach your dog to shush on cue. You do that by first teaching your dog to speak on cue in the kitchen, in your living room, in your yard, everywhere with no mop. Then you get your husband to get a mop and we just have it lying there. And we have the dog speak and shush, speak and shush, speak and shush. Then he holds the mop. Then he waggles the mop, speak and shush, speak and shush. Now we go outside and see your neighbor's mop and say, hey, look, speak. Oh, thank you for telling me there's a mop there. Now, shush. But, it, but people get confused with shush to me from sit. That's how we teach us sit in the kitchen first, then the living room, then the bedroom, then your yard. Before you even think of going in public with this dog and walking it, and saying sit, 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 sit. Well, that's a response reliability of less than 20%. I can't remember what I said <laughs> sit five or six times. I meant to say it five. And that's atrocious that you're telling it to sit five times. So how on earth would you expect that to work when someone's waggling a mop out the window? So it's, you know, teaching shush on cue. This is so simple when you think it through. And then we troubleshoot it and proof also, it to all sorts of different situations. I, I would also personally get a mop just like that and get your dog used to that mop and get that dog used to that mop in your house and get that dog used to that mop in your window. And then and you, you know, bring it out at dinner time. You bring out the mop and say, and then, it's dinner time. When you mop the floor, you have the cleanest uh, city on the uh, kitchen on the block. The left, right? and, 
it's a weird silhouette and it's become a thing, you know, so you can, yeah. you know, for everyone, but um, you can do that. You can totally work that out. Yes. But so it's natural dogs, for dogs. a lot of dogs to naturally become fearful when they're five to eight months old of people carrying long, thin objects, walking sticks, umbrellas. I mean, why do you think they have the umbrella in the ATTS test? You know, because it spooks a lot of dogs and sticks. No, no, you don't have to have the brains of Einstein to work that one out. And so that's why in puppy class, you know, we ask people to come wear something different like rollerblades, carry something different like an umbrella or a stick or a parasol or a, uh, a, a transistor radio. God, we don't even know what transistor radios are now. Transistor, yeah. transistor radios, yeah, that's what people carry around. <laughs> you remember when they were so big, these things, you know, yes. and that people would yes. walk down the street with them on their shoulder, you know, blasting. Now, of course, we yes. just have earphones in, so we get hit by a electric vehicle that we can't hear at all. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Teaching? But, yeah, weird silhouettes and weird key out things and everything. It's good to continue yeah. to work on that. All right, next one. How does a dog know the difference between a dig pit or play in the garden? Ha, ah, that's a good one. I just use a barrier around plants at this time. Well, the whole point of a digging pit is to attract them to it, right? And how do you do that? You bury things. Ha, ah, ha, bury things in this spot. So this is a spot that pays up. This is Ian's. This is all, all yours, right? You know, you, yeah. you're the first person I heard ever say that. Um, you know, burying bones, burying toys. It doesn't be buried very far. Treats. It's just so that this is the area that pays up. It's like an unending treasure trove, right? It's like the giving tree. <laughs> you know, but it's like the, the 49ers. Ground. You know, people, I always say people rushed from New Jersey to California in 1849. They didn't rush from California to New Jersey. You know, someone found gold once. And it starts the rush. And with Omaha, actually, his bone is still in the TV room halfway upstairs. That was the original cow femur that I got from the butcher on and buried in the newly constructed digging pit. And when he found it, his expressions on his face, he thought he had discovered the mother load. And, and it <laughs> reduced. I, I, but back then, I was quantifying everything. I counted the holes in the lawn. The garden was a no-go area, but the lawn, and now it was less than 5%. They were all in the digging pit. And I'd bury so every night, right before I went to bed, I'd go outside and bury something there. You know, tissue paper with three freeze-dried liver treats. In. Or a bunch of critters. You might want to wait till the morning. But either way, how do you not get raccoons digging things up? I don't do morning. Um, all right, next one. We have 10 minutes-ish. Nervous rescue border collie dog seven meets friends friendly, meets another dog, a border collie bitch who's three for the first time. Sadly, my partner didn't read our boy's body language and he air snapped. Now she won't come near. So um, so the new nervous rescue is now staying away from the, the bitch. You know, some dogs don't have a great bounce back. And if that dog is already seven, you know, it might, it might be else. It might be just sensitive dog, but this is just classical conditioning. Don't make them go near each other. Just have them in the same area or in sight and work with, you know, with nice tasty treats and have that dog appear and feed, feed, feed. This is again all Ian, right? Have the dog appear in the room that you're sitting in. Oh, look at that. Look at that cookie dog. Boom, boom, boom. Feed, 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 right? And then have the dog disappear and you stop paying attention to your dog. And then so the dog comes in. And it doesn't have to be in the house in a room. It can be further away if necessary. But they don't have to interact. Let it let it naturally let let it naturally evolve. You know, let this other this dog, you know, learn that it's okay. And you know, if the if he and if your dog your your boy air snapped, well then you know maybe it was just too much too soon for both of them. And border collies can be snappy, you know, and and sensitive. So I wouldn't push it. I would do just happy things and let them be at a distance from each other until they decide that it's okay to be around each other. Yes? I think the, the other thing is um, the number of times I see an air snap. I mean, I don't pay that much attention to it apart from saying, oh, great. It's such an inhibited response to when the dog is upset. But this is so classic. Yeah. 
PC, and so is classic bitchy too. And it's what dogs but do. It, it's no big deal, but it's it true. That's Pardon? the thing. It scared the other. Scared the other dog. The other yeah, dog is upset because the probably dog. so it should because the other dog was a little yeah. over the top, and so now the dog said, "Right, we're going to stop this." And now the other dog's a different dog. I mean, I've seen some dogs uh, have a brain makeover from one snap or one long, low growl from an old, boring male dog. And now they're a different dog forever, which makes life better and safer for them should they meet a dog that's not as well socialized. I would still respond to the air snapping. Oh, that, don't be so silly. And then treats, 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 doing things together and, and you know, well, getting the friendly again. Why would you say don't be so silly when they're, telling, they're expressing their... Who knows what the other dog did? And maybe it was just the sight of the other dog. I, you know, I don't know what the seven-year-old rescue dog did um, to meet, um, you know, when they, when they met. But it sounds like neither of them are that comfortable. So, it, you know, it, it's like okay, fine, you don't get along. What I would try to do is build up the confidence and resiliency of the seven-year-old dog, which you know isn't going to be that quick because it's a seven-year-old dog. But um, you know, if you build up confidence in general, then then that might help as well. It's not the worst problem to have. I think they don't have to be near each other. Just let that work itself out while you do some No, I mean, it's, yeah? again, I think it's a comparatively, when I say comparatively, 99% safe problem to have, unlike a situation mm -hmm. which is not. The dog rushes up and the other dog goes to the hospital with about... 20 bites on him and lacerations and rips that ain't cool okay um luckily it very very rarely happens if dogs are ever allowed to socialize with other dogs they work it out it amazes me how well dogs work it out much better than people do and they develop and, dogs out pretty quickly and they might not they don't have to like they don't have to be best friends you know maybe they're not maybe they're, no. but my guess is they ease in to each other um, if you just don't make don't make it too big of a thing either, just make happy times yeah. around it because you can you can make the thing by being oh you know too 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 nervous around it yourself. All I right, mean, when you next look at, one. You know, real big packs of dogs, like a pack of hunting hounds, um, they've got to get on when they're working, and and other groups of dogs that work um, in groups, you know, search and rescue dogs. There's no time for this. You don't have to love that other dog, but you got to do your job. And for a companion dog, doing your job is being a nice companion to me and tolerant of other people and other dogs around you. Yep. Yep. To a degree. Um, but they don't have to be best friends. Okay. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> um, Sandy, excellent summit. I volunteer to help find missing, lost, or stolen dogs. What do you suggest when we find and try to approach a dog who's frightened? So we can help rescue them. <clears throat> that can be that can be a hard one. Um, this is where I think you, you want know. to go to animal control. Like years ago, 35, 40 years ago, animal control had the best behavior and training conferences in the world. They were largely based around Washington. And I learned a lot because these are people who have hands-on dogs that you don't know, and not all of them are friendly. And um, one guy showed me a technique on the stage. And he just said, I'll show you how I catch a dog that's scared. And they brought a scared dog out, you know, and he was on the stage. And they had him on a long line so he couldn't jump down. And the guy just sat there eating a sandwich. And then he'd toss a few bits of meat to the dog. And then he tossed another bit, another bit. Then he held his hand out like this. The dog took it. Out again, out a third time. Round his shoulder is a, a lariat. He goes, as soon as he moves his hand, what does the dog do? Smack his head back. Now they got him. And then he just walked off away, hand feeding bits of meat as he went. And I thought, well, that's yeah. cool. You, you, you can't follow them. You know, you can't cajole no. them in. You sit no, there mining room with move. this thing, you know, food yeah, well, treats. They, they'll get hurt. They'll get hurt if they are. I, I, I caught a dog just like that once, a, a dog that had been out for 10 days. Somebody dumped him in this feral area. I mean, if, you know, this rural canyon in SoCal. I was there for a seminar, and the lady said, "Yeah, he's sleeping under my car at night, but I can't get him." And um, 
I yeah, just also the more time that they're hungry, the better. So 10 days in, it was a little easier. But yeah, food, I just sat on the side of the road and was thank you, thankfully not a busy street at all and waited and waited. I did the old news trick. Um, and also there's another way to do this, of course, that you you take your bitch and um, you uh, train her to find the scent of other dogs. So that's how you do the fine part. Use a dog and you show him his bed or collar, say, you know, find this scent. But then you, when she goes out, you spray a little bit of estrus urine on her rear end. So when she found him, you just call her and the other dog comes running afterwards, male or female. Oh you know, estrus urine is like catnip to dogs. And you okay. asked me where you get it. Uh, I had a fridge full of gallons of estrus urine um, way back in the 70s. Ew. Are you collecting it yourself? No, for research. Yeah, of course we did. We put the dog in a cage overnight and the urine um, falls into a connection tube. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> useful. Okay. We have time for one more question, probably, unless it's a very short one. Um, if you are taking questions, do you recommend playing exercise before doing a training session or train before? Well, that's a good question. I like this one. And the answer is it depends a lot. Sometimes you have dogs that definitely will benefit from having the edge taken off uh, first. But the, And some often I use a play as a reward after we've had a training session. But the real answer is, drum roll please, integrate the two. Um, you know, mm -hmm. training should be playing. And if you saw MJ's um, presentation today, you can see that training is fun and should always be fun. And these are all tricks to them. So keep your voice happy, smile a lot, use toys in training, not just doling out one treat or two treats, throw some food across the room, take a ball break in the middle, you know, after a couple really good positions or healing moves or whatever it is that you're working on. I'll often leave balls and toys and tugs sprinkled around the training area and we're playing, we're training, 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 because this is using the distraction as the reward. And then when I say, go get it, go get it, or I'll throw another one out of my pocket and, you know, pull it, pull it out and have a surprise. So, although that said, again, you know, I, 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 sometimes you need to take the edge off. It depends. If your dog's been sitting home all day alone, uh, I might, I might do a couple warm up runs with the ball or take them for a little jog. Um, but most of my play with my sport dogs comes in the training and then after training. And then so it's like we're, we're training heavy with some integrated play, then we're play heavy with a little bit of integrated training. And you know they know that they're gonna get a little bit of both. I have just two things to I say. I, I wanna play pros and cons with the advice. With some dogs, you want to take the edge off the dog, you know, tire them out a bit before you train. Pros and cons, well, then the training may go better. However, sometimes I like to take a dog and I say, like I did with Duke today, I let him out the gate without asking him to sit. I was dealing with a monster. And I, straight away when he's dash not sit. And so you meet the beast. And so now your training session for you, developing skills to train a dog that's out of control, you're really going to have a challenge today. So sometimes I don't like take the edge off the dog and I, I always like to approach yeah. the problem from two ends the worst possible training scenario and the best possible training scenario and I think you can learn from both and the dog can learn from both second thing I was going to say was yeah to I want to reiterate uh, what MJ said about you know put play into training also put training into play. Play must have rules or else eventually your dog will get into trouble or, or maybe hurt. And if your dog can ever tell the difference between play and training, you're sunk. The dog shouldn't know. that He looks at training and thinks, oh, I'm having so much fun with this training thing today, you know, or wow, he's put strict about the rules today you know, in playing. If the dog can tell the difference, then you aren't training right. That's that's my view. They should be equally enjoyable and equally in control. Yep, good answer. All right. We, wow, four um, o'clock on the clock. How did you do that, Kelly? I don't know, but um, 
this, I know there are more questions. Um, there is a group on Facebook, join the group. We can join you there. I haven't been able to yet very much because we've been doing the summit, And um, but I will, I will hop on there. Ian, you can hop in there too. Um, you can also see us, um, you know, at the Dunbar Academy. Uh, we have uh, a Facebook group for Dunbar Academy members, the top dogs, you can ask questions there. And if you want to join the Dunbar Academy, uh, you can also, you know, we're there a lot. I'm there a lot. You, you, you can be oh, there. and you're there sometimes. Let's not forget that the week after next, we have a five day, what's it called, reactive dog tool kit. And, uh, yeah, um, you're going to be. I, I just found yeah. out two days ago, I shall be doing uh, with yeah. Jamie. And Jamie. Kelly smirking Jamie. And saying, Jamie said, I needn't be there. And I think, well, I have to be there for five days. So this will be a uh, live no. Q and A for a couple of hours, I think, on Facebook, and then so, it'll be you submit videos and questions, and I yes. should be taping. Let me, see, let me say what Jamie said. Yeah. Okay, so the reactive dog toolkit is not available yet. It will be available in a few days, and you'll all get notified. Um, it's a bundle of videos for reactive and out of control dogs. And if you sign up before March 6th, which you, know, you will get access to that soon, you'll get a pop-up private Facebook group where we'll not only answer questions all week about reactivity and training, except for dangerous dogs. Um, between March 6th and March 10th, there'll be uh, two live Q&As, and you'll be able to submit video for review that Ian can review then as well. So um, very Thank exciting. And <laughs> what? Yeah, they asked. I said, well, I thought I had a whole free yes. week to finish off my book, but it'll be a whole free week no, we're here gonna do about we're reactive gonna dogs. We're going to keep helping these yeah. people. You can do your book after that. Um, well, so, lots of videos yes. in the bundle for them to see. And if you, you know, and if you did upgrade to the act, have access to this this summit um, beyond, you know, today, um, you know, you can ask questions about that too. Um, because this is our last day, this is our last day of the live summit, and you know, uh, I'm, I, I have access, so I'm going to continue to watch. I didn't get through them all, I mean, obviously, I was there for all of them initially, but um, I haven't gotten through all of them. It's a lot of great material, and honestly, I've gone back to a couple of them a few times because they're, they're gems, they're nuggets in there. We have such a great group of presenters, I'm thrilled with how that came together. Um, and thank you to all Good of our summit. presenters, well done, Kelly, in their time. It was all Kelly. Because, um, I didn't do a thing apart from be here for these Q and A's and be constantly fun. told I'm going on and on and on. Oh. And I should. There are <laughs> links in in the in the in the comments here to the control ordering the control, um, the reactive dog toolkit bundle. So thank you everybody. It's been so fun to do this, and I hope we do it again because there are so many topics. You know, I think it's kind of nice to dive into. You know, one topic at a time and kind of stay focused and I don't know, I had a blast. Thank you I think for, the for one, being here. For the next pet summit that if if I'm involved in it should be fun and games. Just videos of all yeah. the games you can play with your dogs. Just you know, mainly video because then it would be effortless to watch. People would be laughing and oh that's a neat idea and that's cool, you know. Like my favorite, you know, when you try and motivate your owners in class to work, you say, right, homework tonight, sit, stay, and they come back the next week, no one's done it. But if instead you just say, see this ribbon? It goes to the person next week who can balance a biscuit on their dog's nose for the longest. And then, of course, I always make sure a little boy wins it, you know, because I'm a biased judge and I take bribes. And then when he gets the ribbon, I say, it out. And he says, yes, serious puppy training, first place. Longest sit stay, two and a half minutes yeah. in one week. Okay, it's amazing. Gamifying dog training—that's what it's all about. And then all the reactivity yeah. and trick to disappear. Trick innovation. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Have fun with your dog. Happy training, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We'll Thank see you, you next time. We Thanks for listening. Bye bye. Oh, watching as well. I guess we're we're on camera, right? We on camera.